Good afternoon, Kevin. How you doing? Great. How you doing? I'm blessed always, in always. Can't complain. All the all Brilliant. the better for speaking to you though, um, sir. You're uh, you're currently leading a campaign for an autonomous investment fund to support black creative enterprises. We ran your open letter on the voice uh, online on the voices website. Yeah. Um, so if, if viewers, uh, listeners haven't seen that, they can go and check that out now. Um, but in addition to what you wrote and to bring people up to speed, if they aren't aware, what are you doing? And, and tell us in your own words. Well, I mean, the main point of it is that we've had a situation within the arts and kind of creative sector where Black-led or BAME-led organisations have been underfunded for quite some time. So there's been a lot of effort and, you know, I think credit has to be given where it's due um, to try and inc- improve diversity and in try- to try and improve representation within the arts and creative industries. And that's been going on for the last, you know, 50, maybe 60 years. But the long and short of it is, is that as much as we do have to acknowledge that the work has gone in, we also have to acknowledge that it hasn't worked. And, and I think the main, there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that I think the strategies have just been the wrong one. So I think that, that there's been kind of four approaches to improving diversities, broadly speaking. One is to just um, use quotas. So to try and improve the, the number of kind of employees or leaders within arts organizations and creative organizations generally and and again that hasn't really been that successful so if you look at all of the major institutions they still are predominantly white run the second approach really is around um, looking at trying to create I guess similar type cultural or or arts um, institutions um, that are black led so I think you've got things like the Birdie Grant Art Center you had the drum in, in Birmingham, or you've got Innova um, in London. And these were all big kind of capital projects, you know, 15, 20 million pounds went into building these business, um, these buildings. Um, and black leaders were kind of put um, in to run them. And each of those projects has failed effectively. And we can't say anything different to that. So to the extent that they still exist, they're pretty much invisible. Um, but most of them, frankly, well, well, most of them don't exist now. So, you know, so something's happened there. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's sad on so many different levels, because obviously on the, on the one hand, you've got the, the fact that the money that's gone in hasn't been benefiting the community and it's public money as well. So everybody loses out. And also because I did some research on this, the the leaders themselves have been impacted right so they've 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 been put into organizations that in many ways were set up to fail and so they end up um in situations where you know they've been kind of undermined and and they haven't been able to kind of lead those organizations to you know a point of success so it's a kind of is a failure for the sector because it's not been diverse diversified it's a failure for the taxpayer whose money is not being wasted and it's a fa- failure for the individual black leader who you know w- was put into a situation where you know it was never going to work and then the, th- the third I guess approach is looking at proportionate funding so um, BAME communities um, are 14 percent of the UK population approximately and uh and so we could say, you know what, if the Arts Council budget, give or take, is £450 million, then, you know, 14% of that um, should go to BAME-related projects. And actually, when I look at the, 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 the major platform of Arts Council funding, for example, which is what's called their kind of NPO portfolio, um, that's the um, national kind of institutions that you know make up the bulk of um um of the art sector in the in the uk then only about 2.6 percent of um that that money which is i i I think about 450 um, million pounds goes to bame organizations and like i said that number should be something more like you know 14 percent. so it's significantly underfunded right um and the reality of that is that that approach has never been tried, but given where we've got to with 
the up, I guess we're anticipating a, a, a recession, if not a depression, in, because of all of the COVID stuff. There's no prospect really that um, the Arts Council or, or the DCMS are going to sanction um, a serious increase in um, or a proportionate increase of, of BAME funding. They're not going to go from 2.6% to 14% funding for BAME organisations. That's just not going to happen. So the only other approach really was looking at something called what I called autonomy, which is to set up something just completely different that uses a completely different model, but which is black run effectively and allows us to basically create something, fund something in a completely different way and create something that is that allows us to grow our own um, arts, cultural, creative um, um, organisations in the way that we would want to grow them. So it's not trying to create another, the equivalent of another opera house or the equivalent of another national gallery in, you know, that's black lead. It's really just trying to say, well, actually, what is it that's relevant to BAME communities? And for me, the whole thing there is someone like a Michaela Cole is a creative person she is an artist she is somebody but she also is somebody that has a mass audience and I, I think if we can deploy um, um, resources in developing you know the next Michaela Cole or you know the next Stormzy or whoever it might be then actually there's a way to take what limited funds there are right now and invest it in a way that actually not only div delivers diversity um, cultural diversity on our screens and in our concert halls and in our theatres, but will also, um, I guess, um, generate its own income. So it will divorce um, us from the decisions of either the DCMS or major funders like the Arts Council or the, the major um, trusts and foundations that have, like I said, over the last 50 years, failed to really find a, a strategy that's worked to support us as a community, if that makes sense. Just, just to be clear, um, Kevin, the, what you're asking for is not money that isn't already there already. It isn't already there. This, this, as you wrote in your open letter, this can be delivered within Arts Council England's existing diversity an innovation budget, right? This is not correct. Correct. This I mean, is not I... extracting from a new place. This is you saying di redivert the funds. Yeah. Uh, and if phase one proves to be successful, then let's show an incremental increase that reflects that. Is that is that? Am I right? I think that? that's that's exactly right. So again, it was trying to be pragmatic. It was trying to be constructive, and and take what resources there is that's already there and deploy it in a completely different way that allows us to basically, you know, grow something new. And I did that deliberately because I wanted, I wanted to make it within um, the Arts Council and other funders, to be fair, within their, their capacity to do it. Now, the, the challenge, I guess, with what I'm proposing is that it really requires uh, a redistribution of power, effectively, because what we're saying is, you know, if you, we're not asking for more money, but we are asking for more autonomy. We are asking for more decision-making um, power to enable us to kind of make the right decisions that will mean that we can actually, you know, make the change we want to see, which is to diversify um, the, the sector, but also, yeah, diversify the kind of the, the output and therefore the audiences. A bit about you, Kevin. I mean, it doesn't take much digging to understand um, that your life's work has been immersed in creating opportunities, especially for black people within the arts sector. So talk about the two main companies which I've been, I've been made aware of. Yeah, so initially I started out back in the day, I uh, set up a, a, an organisation called Tribal Tree, which was really, I guess, mirroring my own experience of, of trying to establish myself and you know um yeah and, and build my own career so I started off in the music industry and I think music was absolutely a tool for me coming through school that kept me on the straight and narrow and I, I grew up on a north London housing estate and again I think like most young black men you there is a line that you 
are faced with in terms of you know crossing either into doing kind of stuff that's constructive and and keep you know staying on the, on the straight and narrow or maybe joining you know um, a gang or, or getting involved in criminal activity and for me music was the the anchor that just kept me focused on what it was that I wanted to do so I wanted to create something that allowed other people who were in danger of dropping out of school or getting involved in kind of you know criminal activity to use music as an anchor as I had to build a, a relatively successful music career so Tribal helped launch the um, people like Plan B um, Amir from um, rudimental, um, phaser from N dubs, various people that come through. And again, it, it, it was a simple idea of just taking these guys. I had a studio in Chalk Farm and using the, the that studio facility in order to give these guys an opportunity. And it was nothing more than absolutely a, a kind of charitable activity. But what happened was that actually we were able to convert that raw talent into stuff that then became commercially successful. And it was then that was the light bulb moment for me that saying, well, actually, there's just untapped talent on the street that can be nurtured and developed and converted to kind of commercial success. And that was kind of the route for me, we, if that makes sense. But I realized that actually there's more to um, building a successful organization and, and to doing, growing the scale of the project than just delivering the good work because what we've done is we've done something that no other music organization of its type had done and there were plenty of organizations getting money from arts council and various other funders and we had kind of done stuff that they hadn't um and yet when it came down to it um arts council defunded us so I suddenly realized, well, something else is going on here. And I, it dawned on me that I didn't quite understand what it was. I thought good work would result in more money and kind of a, an opportunity to expand your impact. And it, and it just didn't. And so I then took out a couple of years and I did something called the Claw Leadership Program, which was fantastic. And I did a master's in business and responsibility. And that time gave me the time to just research, well, what's going on here? What is it that stops... Um, community projects on the ground that are delivering powerful work from really growing. And then I started to look into race, um, identity and power and how these things kind of work together and what it is that's actually preventing us from moving forward. And I think it was that, again, as a, as a, as a learning process that made me realise, well, actually, as a leader, I need to kind of do stuff different. I need to kind of network. I need to kind of up my own power base and connections and my ability to kind of talk at that uh, at a higher level rather than just at a community level I needed to kind of connect with people who had influence and were able to kind of help me develop the project and I think over that two years I learned I, I basically had closed down um, tribal and spent my time spent that time developing myself and then out of that process came Miwi which was effectively an extension of tribal but not working just in the music industry but working right across the creative industries and effectively trying to provide I guess the kind of support to leaders um, and especially to black leaders that I hadn't had if that makes sense so to enable them also to operate at that kind of higher level and to kind of convert what their projects um, into projects that were delivering a kind of higher orbit than you know they they had been kind of previously um and that was it i mean I, I and the other thing i was trying to do is i because i felt slightly um cheated or undermined by the grant um by grant funding previously like i said there was no relationship between you know performance and you know kind of investment so I was like no this is not the place for me so what I decided to do was not to go to uh 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 you know the kind of you know public sector for funding but to start off by going to the commercial sector because I think if one thing I like about you know business is that if you can show it works they'll kind of continue to invest if that makes sense so it's all about the results within you know the commercial sector whereas within the public sector it's not quite about that it is about what seems to be results so what i didn't 
I, I, I genuinely thought that actually everybody would just tell the truth, right? But what happens is that I think organizations who are set up to have um, um, evaluation that kind of can show that they're doing all of the things that they're, you know, they're doing, even if they're not, can actually continue to get funding and and then, and then you know organizations that are actually doing the work on the ground but may not be able to articulate their impact as clearly won't get the cash but long story short we approached a company called ingenious media they effectively agreed to give us access to funding to get us started and and and, and access to a pot of a, of a million pound to invest in BAME creative entrepreneurs and then I use that as leverage to go to the Arts Council and say, okay, we need another million pounds from you to help us develop the talent, if that makes sense. And, and that was basically the launch of MeWe. And, 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 and again, the thing I learned there was don't start off small. Start off with what you need to give you enough runway for success. And so for me, the whole idea of going in for that kind of money was when I'd been used to asking for tens of thousands of pounds in the public sector was, was kind of a bit strange. But I think all of that development that I'd done on myself made me, made me, I guess, pick up and learn that you have to do it at the level that you need to do it at to give you, you know, the runway um, of success. And, you know, um, touch wood, it's been 10 years now. Um, we've continued to be funded both by Arts Council, we also have a, a, an ongoing partnership with Deutsche Bank where we've, we've run their program. We also um, had a building in, in Soho Square, which was also a source of income for us because we would use the building as a way of generating revenue. And so over time, having initially started off with, um, you know, that million pounds from Arts Council, we've just reduced our reliance on their funding just by doing what we do through other means in order to, um, so that if, if ever there was a policy change at, at, at Arts Council, we wouldn't be um, you know, at their mercy in that sense. If the, if the funding was cut, we'd be able to survive. And, and actually what's happened through COVID has been interesting because whilst others have, I guess, struggled, we have been able to build up enough reserves so that through the whole of the you know, scenario situation, we've been able to survive and actually I think we've had one of our best years. Interesting. Very interesting. Lenny Henry, former yeah. culture secretary Chris Smith and Matthew Taylor, CEO yeah. of the RSA, they've all supported your campaign. Yeah and, um, we, and I, just, I guess you and just for more people. Yeah just Kanye King has come on board today and it's you know it, you I really start I mean it's it was interesting because I didn't jump into this. I really didn't. I, it was about two e weeks of real angst about whether or not this was something that I wanted to do. But I guess what tipped me into it was the fact that, one, I was hearing a lot of noise from the Black community within the arts about what the problem was. But I wasn't seeing anything in terms of solution. And... So I was kind of waiting for it and waiting for it, but not seeing it. And then the other thing was, and so there was a thing of, do, do I do something about this? And, and, and I knew it would take up a lot of time and it would kind of, you know, be pretty much all consuming. Um, and the, the deciding, I went for a walk one day and the deciding factor was just the fact that I was thinking there's COVID, there's George Floyd and all the, the Black Lives Matter kind of scenario and there's an impending kind of recession, all kind of coming together in, in, in one <laughs> ball of kind of craziness, all of which I know are gonna be impacting our communities <laughs> disproportionately as we all know. And I thought, look, if, if we don't try and do this now, and I didn't hold that much hope to be honest, and I'm, you know, I'm, we're still involved in the fight and I, that's why I really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, to give this airtime. Um, if we didn't do this now, if we couldn't do this now, we will never be able to do it. This was the moment, if, you know, that, that, that it, it has the potential to really gain traction, especially because everybody's come out and made statements about, you know, um, wanting to see more diversity. Everybody's come out 
and 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 made pledges about how they really want to you know want to see change and so i just thought well you know what now there's a level of accountability because there's the you know the claims have been made and now we can hold people to account and but we couldn't hold people to account without having some kind of solution and that's why I, I had to kind of divorce myself from I mean look everybody was right in terms of what they were saying about what the problems were and we, we we know what the problems were but nobody was had yet come with a suggestion and that's all mine is it's, it's just a suggestion as to what can be done differently and at this point I mean I can I could definitely you know point to all of the kind of the, I mean I'm saying look judge us by the results right I'm not I'm saying give us a, a what what there is now in the budget and what you're spending now on diversity through all your different kind of strands of activity you know no it's not working move that money across reinvest it and you know if you've had 50 years of failure gives uh, it's almost a case of why not give something else a chance why not try another strategy? Apart from the fact that actually there's something morally right and politically right about um, redistributing power in terms of how decisions are made within the art sector, in terms of what matters to us as, as to what counts as culture and art and creativity, if that makes sense. Kevin Osborne, it's been a pleasure talking to you about your campaign and um, I'm hoping that everything that you're after comes to fruition. I do get the sense it's a time for a change. Um, be interesting to see how this is supported or if the beginning of pursuing some kind of solution that's not been pursued before um, leads us into a place where more discussions are centred on solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so even if this is solution, you know, the early version maybe solution 2.0 will be more fitting. Um, but I sense that that's the direction that you want to head in anyway. So whether it looks like this or whatever shape it takes forming, um, yeah, the way it's gone for the last 50 years, it doesn't work. So, mm. yeah. I appreciate that. And I'll keep you posted on how we go.